Hello, this is Joe Polish, president of Piranha Marketing and founder of the Genius Network interview series, and you're about to hear one of my Genius Network interviews, and I just want to thank you for taking the time to listen to this, and I hope you find it very useful. If you want to find out more information about some of the interviews and resources that can help you in your business, you can go to www.joepolish.com. And we have a Joe Polish Recommends section with all kinds of resources and vendors and services and products that we recommend that can help you in your business. And also for more useful interviews and a whole list of other people that I've interviewed, you can go to www.geniusnetwork.com. Thanks and enjoy the interview. Hello, this is Joe Polish, president of Piranha Marketing and founder of the Genius Network interview series. And today I am going to be doing an interview with one of the brightest human beings on the planet, uh, Dr. Nathaniel Brandon. I'm going to read you a little bit of his bio just so I don't leave anything out. It uh, could be way more than I'm going to say, but uh, this guy is quite an amazing individual, and I'm very happy to be doing this interview right now. Can you hear me okay, Nathaniel? Perfectly. Wonderful. Okay, so who is Nathaniel Brandon? Ph.D., pioneered the psychology of self-esteem. He's a practicing psychotherapist in Los Angeles and also does corporate consulting. Dr. Brandon offers workshops, seminars, and conferences on applying self-esteem principles to the problems of modern business. He addresses the relationship between self-esteem and such issues as leadership, effective communication, and managing change. Dr. Brandon has a Ph.D. in psychology and a background in philosophy. He's written 20 books, which have been translated into 18 languages. More than 4 million copies are in print, including the classic The Psychology of Self-Esteem, originally published in 1969. In it, he explains the need for self-esteem, the nature of that need, and how self-esteem, or lack of it, affects our values, responses, and goals. His many books, including Honoring the Self, The Six Pillars of Self-Esteem, The Art of Living Consciously, and a personal memoir, My Years with Ayn Rand, Many of his books have been translated into foreign languages and worldwide have sold over 4 million copies. His most recent book, Self-Esteem at Work, deals with the application of his work in the field of self-esteem to the challenges of business in an information age economy, which is one of the many reasons why I was uh, so happy to want to do an interview with Dr. Brandon is because most of the listeners are entrepreneurs, and I believe he has knowledge and wisdom that would be instrumental. And if you want more information about Nathaniel Brandon, you can visit his website at NathanielBrandon.com, which we will talk about later in this interview. But nonetheless, uh, let me say, uh, Dr. Brandon, thank you for taking the time to do this interview. Uh, it's, I'm absolutely looking forward to it. I recently met you at a conference where you were speaking to doctors and therapists, and we had just by uh, luck, you happened to walk by during lunch, and I asked you to sit down and have lunch with me if you were available, which you were, and we had a great chat. And then I, I gave you a ride to the airport so you can go back to uh, to your home in, in Los Angeles area. And uh, here we are now doing an interview. So anything that uh, I didn't say about you on the bio that you think would be important for the listener to know before I start asking you some questions? The only thing I can think of is that I have clients, both personal and corporate, but not confined to my office, but the majority of which are from people around the world, and the consultation is via the telephone. Wonderful. So you spend a lot of time talking to people all over the world because uh, now... On the telephone. On the telephone, yes. Great, great. Well, you know what? I'm going to encourage people, you know, with before we even get any questions, if you've not read of, uh, any of uh, Nathaniel's books, uh, absolutely go out and do that. Uh, the book Taking Responsibility is one of my favorites. The Art of Living Consciously is great. And so... There's so many different areas, uh, uh, Nathaniel, that I could ask you about, but I'm just going to really just ask you some that I think would be most applicable uh, to our listeners uh, to get a real good understanding of what you know and how, how it would apply to their life. So, uh, ready? Yes. Okay. So now you're referred to as a specialist on self-esteem, so I'd like to ask you uh, what is your definition of self-esteem and why should uh, we care about it? Self-esteem is our experience of being able to cope with the basic challenges of life and as worthy of love, respect, success, in a word, happiness. Think about it this way. If we knew someone who, whatever his other assets or virtues might possess, if we knew such a person who basically felt, who am I to know? Who am I to think? How can I be expected to manage this change? Nobody told me about this in advance we would recognize that the person involved has got a self-esteem problem. Right. Or again, if a person communicated that they felt they don't really deserve to be loved or they don't deserve to be happy or they don't deserve to be successful, there again 
surely it's obvious that you're talking about a self-esteem problem. So the two elements that I talk about, which we will call self-efficacy and self-respect, capture both sides of the aspect of self-esteem. For example, by self-efficacy, I mean confidence in our ability to think, confidence in our ability to respond appropriately to the challenges of change, confidence for our ability to cope in general with the core or the basic challenges of life. And second, self-esteem entails the idea of feeling worthy of happiness, worthy of love. The tragedy of so many lives is they may have the talent, they may have the skill, they may have everything to succeed except one fatal thing is missing. They feel they don't deserve it. They don't feel not worthy of it. And therefore, they self-sabotage, self-destruct. Well, I was going to say that um, for these reasons, uh, I condensed the whole issue into that one sentence. Self-esteem is the experience of being competent to cope with the basic challenges of life and as being worthy of happiness. Why is it important? Because if you don't understand clearly what the target is, you're not going to hit it. One of the reasons why psychologists have great difficulty teaching uh, self-esteem is because too many of them think it just is a they think it's a feel-good phenomenon. They think I feel good about myself and it's because it's a good self-esteem. If I don't feel good about myself, I got bad self-esteem. It's nowhere like that. It's not a high that you get from a drug or a love affair. If somebody told you that made you a compliment, so now your self-esteem is gone through the roof. That ain't self-esteem. It can be a pleasurable feeling. Lots of things can make us feel good that don't necessarily have anything to do with self-esteem. So I might get a new car and really love it and sort of love driving and it makes me really feel like I'm on a high when I'm driving it. That doesn't mean that it gives me my self-esteem. What it gives me my self-esteem is more likely to be the mental operations that I performed in the in the context of my work that, that permitted me to, uh, to buy a nice car. Right. So uh, I'm happy to say, while there's a long road ahead, based on the emails that I received from my electronic world, uh, more and more people seem to be accepting and signing on for my definition of self-esteem and admitting that it really does cover the issue more, compromens- or more comprehensively than any other currently available. In the history of psychology, there were people who tried to make self-esteem an issue of just of competence or efficacy on one side, or in others who talked about worthiness the other side. I'm the first person to have ever brought the two together into one unified theory of self-esteem. Why that area? Why did you choose that area out of all the different... Uh, I mean, you obviously are quite have quite an expansive uh, career, uh, but why self-esteem? I began to have a private practice very, very young in life. I mean, today it would be almost impossible. When I was 25 years old and working on my degree at UCLA, New York University, I was already had a, a few patients, and uh, I was always interested in what is it that the patients are doing right when they are growing in self-esteem, and what are they missing or failing to do right when they are falling in self-esteem? And it became like an empirical question. I felt like a detective trying to learn that one of the key issues that either results in self-esteem growth or diminishing. And uh, out of that came the idea of uh, the question, what the heck is self-esteem exactly? And then you just think about it and you be aware of what context in which you use those words. And you, after a while, you begin to realize what you're talking about are these two issues, the issue of self-efficacy and this, uh, the issue of being worthy and not unworthy or undeserving. It's simply an issue of paying attention to your clients, listening to what your clients tell you, watching the behavior and seeing those if there's a significant difference in how they operate in the world, that difference relates quite often to the level of their self esteem. And so you put all this together and you arrive tentatively at the definition that I propose, but then you start looking for exceptions. And in several years now, since I first put the definition into play, I guess it's more like fifteen years now. I haven't been unable to find any exceptions to the general idea that I put forth. Yeah. Now, can I ask you a question about worthiness? Because uh, you, you said that people feel worthy or unworthy. When, when someone feels unworthy or worthy, is that 
per se a choice? Is it because of something that happened to them that they're doing or not doing? I imagine, I mean, certainly I'm not a, a psychologist. Uh, by well, any... for example, one of the first questions I'll ask a new client is, did you feel loved by your mother? Did you feel loved by your father? Uh, if the answer is no, the odds very much favor that there's going to be a self-esteem problem there because uh, it's not unnatural. It is natural to think that my own mother and my own father couldn't love me. What am I to expect from anybody else in this world? Consequently, the issue of worthiness has to do with, am I a good person? Am I a person that other people could respect or admire? And uh, at the same time, it doesn't mean that uh, anybody in particular you know, has to love me. Some people will like me, other people may not. That's a, that's a different issue. But um, it's a challenge in another way, too, that it should be mentioned, which is the following. See, if you're reasonably confident in yourself and reasonably confident in your, in your right to be happy, if you can do whatever it takes to be happy, if you can do that, then, then you meet somebody and you, you fall in love, let us say. Uh, it doesn't. It's not shocking to you that the person loves you back. In other words, that it isn't just you who love the person, but the person loves you. That feels kind of natural, and as it should be, and it's wonderful. But if instead you feel shocked, astonished, oh no, this is a mistake. She doesn't know me very well. She really knew me, and if the person feels that you really knew me, you couldn't love me, and then that leads to almost losing respect for the person who got suckered and who. It loves you when you knew you didn't deserve it. So naturally, what you're going to see there is a sabotage of the whole relationship. The person who feels unworthy or undeserving will find ways to prove that he's right by doing things which have the net effect of destroying the relationship. So would it absolutely be a true statement that you would not be capable of loving another human being if uh, you're, you don't love yourself? In the full sense of love, I would say that's correct. I would say not that you can't need the other person, not that you can't admire the person the other way, but if there is no sense of one's own value, I can't even imagine how such a person could negotiate a successful marriage or a successful relationship. You see this all the time. People who are afraid of being alone, afraid of being abandoned, afraid of being left out, who uh, do things which would increase the probability that they will be left out because they turn people off by maybe too many self-deprecatory talks or referrals or uh, too many self-deprecatory statements or too much jealousy or too much, too many endless demands for more reassurance that you really love me. And you can drive a person nuts who started off having a really nice, lovely, wonderful relationship and went down the troops. Why? Because one or both people didn't really feel that happiness was their birthright. There are people right now who are listening to this conversation, listening to my voice, know exactly what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Now, just so I can make a distinction here, um, sure. I think it's really important for you know all human beings to not only focus and understand this message, what you're talking about. A lot of people that are listening because they're business owners that a lot of maybe never even you know, visit a therapist or pursued any sort of development in this area, um, how would this apply to work? How would this apply to a business owner? Well, it would apply on many different levels. To begin with, the CEO or the company president sets the kind of pattern of what kind of an organization it's going to be. Uh, a leader or a CEO has to be a teacher in a sense. He has to be an inspirer, and he has to be working on the task that needs to be done and working on facilitating the people doing the task that needs to be done and understanding that it's not about him being brilliant. It's about him handling or bringing in people who can be brilliant. And whether you're a manager or a CEO, the principle is the same. Unfortunately, businessmen, pardon me, CEOs sometimes feel themselves in the popularity context with their own employees so that they want to make it an issue if I'm right and you're wrong. And they're, out, they're eager to prove that they're right and to wipe the other guy off the mat. And uh, this is no good. It, it's a poison for a relationship if the person with the idea that he wants to put forth, for example, but he knows it's going to become an issue of the, the, the boss versus me. Not the, instead of the boss saying, well, this is very interesting. Let's take a look at this. Tell us more about it, Joe. 
Do you follow what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. You mentioned a book of mine that I wrote uh, a short while ago called Self-Esteem at Work, and I discussed many more examples of how it's a CEO self-esteem will be manifest in the way that he manages. One of the things that you won't see is the senior person in an adversarial relationship with the people a little bit lower down on the ladder. And that more broadly, you know, when I do things sometimes for an organization, people don't initially ask me, how do I create a culture of promoting self-esteem in my company? What they do ask, how can I produce a culture in my business that will inspire people to give their best to the work? Those are two different questions, but the answer is interesting because the answer in both cases would be the same. Do you follow what I'm saying? Yes. Yes, I do. Uh, that whether the goal is to create a culture of self-esteem or whether the goal is to inspire people to give their best, what you would want to do, the actions you'd want to take as the boss in the, or the senior people, whoever, is the same. Treat people with respect, learning how to be genuinely open to new ideas, creating a style of uh, organization and of, uh, and of creative activity requires a sense that I've got something of value to offer. I have to give my reasons, I have to give my grounds of my belief, but I've got something worthwhile to offer. I put it on the table. It maybe it will be shot down, maybe it should be shot down, maybe it's going to go somewhere. But what's important is what attitudes do we bring? Do we want the other guy to win, or are we only interested in being a winner ourselves? And that's still another aspect of how self-esteem shows up in a business setting, an organization setting. Whether you're kind of a really out to ask yourself what needs to be done, what needs to be done, and do that, versus who's to blame, who screwed up. What can go on forever discussing? Well, I'll just mention one more point. Studies have been done of business failure, and they find that one of the commonest problems or causes of business failure is executive fear of making decisions. But what's that? if not a fear or a lack of confidence in one's own mind and judgment. And what's a lack of confidence in one's own mind or judgment but a problem of self-esteem? So low self-esteem people tend to scapegoat, alibi, do everything except deal with what needs to be done, where did I miss the boat, what can I do to correct it? It's rather been a self-defense mode than a protecting themselves against uh, who knows what from the higher ups from being... Uh, criticized perhaps for mistakes I made. Of course, you know, mistakes are very interesting. There are good mistakes and there are bad mistakes. What are good mistakes? Good mistakes are when we're trying out new things, we're learning new things, and we're learning what doesn't work as much as we've learned about what does work. Thomas Edison, as I guess everybody knows, was very strong on that point. He t- when he would talk about how much he learned, you know, what did he learn? He learned around a thousand different things you couldn't make light with. That's was what he learned. So the 11th thing was what you could do. That's about what I can say briefly. Absolutely. You know, the biggest sales job that people need to do is the sales job they do on themselves uh, for confidence, for what directions, for what people to hang out with, for what to put into their heads. And so you as a young person uh, did an incredible sales job on yourself because uh, there was some sort of internal self-talk that was going on with you and still is that many people, I don't believe, have or even think of. And, and that's what I want to try to ask you about and see if you can identify that. In your, in your book, you write about 19 essential secrets of entrepreneurship. And so people are looking for shortcuts. You did say something really important, which is there are no magic pills. And, uh, you know, there isn't. I mean, you're going to have to put uh, some sort of time, money, or energy into any sort of skill set. However, there are shortcuts. And there are things that are much better ways of doing something than others. And there are individuals like you that have identified those things and share those things and use those things day in and day out and, and talk about those. So um, what I first want to ask you is, what is the internal dialogue uh, in your head that allows you to have the accomplishments that you have? And, it, you know, what was it when you first started? Because I want to let our listeners take a sneak peek into some of the self-talk that Cameron Johnson gives himself because you really, you know, accomplish amazing things. Well, well, thanks. Um, I think you have to stay grounded 
um, in order to be successful with anything. And um, I've never been one to have an ego. I've never had a flashy lifestyle. Of course, you know, growing up with 14, 15 years old, um, and you've got, uh, you know, really nice income. My One of my companies was generating $15,000 a day in revenue when I was 15. But, you know, I've, I've never been one to, to wear the flashy clothes or to have an ego. I've always lived two separate lives, and that is the life of my, my businesses, and then that's the life of my personal life where I was always the normal, you know, 17-year-old, 18-year-old. I was always that, that normal high school kid. And um, I think you have to stay grounded, and you have to really realize what's important. And that's kind of really helped me. But I've also had kind of an open dialogue with, with myself. Um, I've got a great relationship with myself. We um, talk frequently. No, but seriously, what I was, I guess. You're your invisible friend on your shoulder. Exactly. No, 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 no. But this is really important. I mean, it may sound weird to people, but I, I think, you know, how you feel right now is exactly based on, the, you know, the direction you're, t- you're giving yourself. Well, I always had kind of a, a big debate whether or not I should you know, put my entire story out there and to write a book. And, you know, I really said I need to make it uh, less about me so much in that I don't need to, I guess, question why I'm writing the book because the only reason I would even consider sharing my story is to try and inspire others, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, I think any really true successful people, and when I when I think of a successful person, I mean money is, is, is one form of, of success and in, in the business world. It, it certainly is a, is a scorecard, and, and if your endeavor is to start a business and make profits, then the better you assemble that business to do and accomplish that objective, the more successful, quote-unquote, that business actually is. But a successful human being, I mean, I don't look at a, a person who's become a, a billionaire by selling you know, tobacco products uh, to people uh, as, as a very successful business person. I mean, they may use very successful techniques that can be taken from other businesses, but the end result is, you know, they sell a product that kills people. So I have an interesting perspective on success. I also look at, the, at, at how the person actually is. I mean, you mentioned something about ego. That's what people constantly say. They're like, my God, you know, you can actually talk to this guy. It's like, well, should you think you wouldn't be able to talk to him? I mean, he has problems and issues like any other human being. He's just assembled his life. Uh, in a certain way, and you have done a fabulous job of not uh, adopting an ego. And, and there are many people that we know that have had success, and they and it completely goes to their head, and they're abusive to people, and they look down on people. And you are just a guy that really wants to help. And you know, uh, I, I hope that continues for the rest of your existence because I think that is the one thing that allows you to have great success. Now. In all of that, you have discovered shortcuts. Uh, there are things that you do and have used that anyone listening, if they used them in their business, used them in their life, would probably get some pretty good success out of them. So can you rattle off a few things? Yeah, well, I think the first one is the first chapter in my book, and that is put yourself out there. The first step you have to do to, to get into the great school you want to go to or to get the great job that you don't think you're qualified for or to start the business you've always dreamed of is to put yourself out there and actually take the first step. You know, it's easy for us to, to have great ideas and to talk about it with all of our friends and family and to, you know, say, oh, wow, I wish I had come up with that. Or if we see a new product that comes out, we say, oh, I I thought of that or, you know, that's simple enough. Well, that's exactly true. The simplest ideas are sometimes the most successful. And uh, I think that you have to be willing to kind of say, hey, I'm going to go for it and I'm going to do whatever it takes to make it happen and I'm not going to take no for an answer. And that's the first nugget I can share with anyone because anything else I can say and that's why I made it the first chapter is all the other chapters don't matter if you're not willing to take the first step and to actually actually live that lesson and live that principle day by day and that's exactly what I do I put myself out there and I literally go for whatever it is I want and uh, I almost don't take no for an answer and if you know if I can't get in one way if I can't get through the door then I'll climb through the window and I will figure out a way to make something happen and I think that's kind of my mantra in life is I, uh, I make it happen, and I think that that's really important. And uh, I think you also should find great mentors. Um, I've been very fortunate that I grew up with, um, in, in my book I talk about mentors, but to me a mentor isn't someone that you just go and have coffee with once a week or once a month or once a year. It, it can be someone that you don't have a relationship with. And to me, I looked up to Michael Dell, Donald Trump, uh, Richard Branson, and Bill Gates as mentors even though I didn't have a personal relationship with any of them when I was a young kid. And I think that that's the purpose of reading books and of reading, uh, you know, material and attending uh, seminars and boot camps is to have that kind of uh, mentality to say, hey, I want to learn from this person. There's something I can get from them. And I think you have to be willing to, uh, I guess, 
to actually take that first step, but to also realize, hey, there is something I can learn from this person, and maybe I should be quiet. You know, God gave me two ears and one mouth for a reason. Maybe I should just be quiet and listen for a minute and uh, try and, and absorb whatever I can. Well, well you know, some people, uh, when they're young, they look up to athletes, they look up to musicians, they adopt, uh, you know, a lot of skills. And, and what's funny is, and I've, I've interviewed, uh, you know, a few um, very successful young people in, in the financial area. Uh, you are definitely the top of the list in terms of someone who's just, from a money perspective, the ability to build businesses at such a young age and sustain it uh, for such a period of time. Now, do you look at other people that are young and that have excelled in sports or excelled in, you know, entertainment in other areas and say, well, you know, how do I redirect that sort of talent in the business environment? Meaning, you know, you said growing up you admired Donald Trump and Richard Branson and Bill Gates, and while a lot of other kids are playing with G.I. Joes and stuff, you're sitting there looking at business leaders. I mean, uh, why was your area of developing talent and skill business? Do you have any idea why you chose that, or was it, or did it choose you? I guess I realized I was never going to play professional basketball or have any kind of singing talent or anything else. And I think <laughs> I think that you know it's it's great if I was a, if I was a talented basketball player um, and I played soccer for 13 years. Um, but, but if I was a talented basketball player, then I probably would have looked up to some of those athletes and uh, wanted to be just like them. But I realized that hey, that's not going to happen. I'm probably going to be in the business world like 99.9 percent of everyone else. So maybe I should start learning about maybe getting a job or starting a business or kind of living on my own or saving money because I felt I felt like you know those are things I could actually control. I can't control that you know I'm five foot eight and I'm not six foot eight, so I'm not going to be able to play basketball. And I I feel like that you know maybe that has something to do with it. But when we we go back to egos for a second and people say, wow, look at Cameron Johnson, he's a successful young person. And I think this is also one reason why I don't have an ego is because I'm always holding myself to a much higher standard. So while someone else might look at, you know, my different past in my history and say, wow, look at what a success he is, to me it's just my life, and that's it. That's what I grew up with. That's kind of what I know. And I hold myself to a much higher standard. There's so many other things I want to do in the world, and, you know, it's going to be hard actually to shake my image as, you know, the boy wonder kid or, or whatever and uh, to, try, to try and continue to leverage and parlay that success into much greater success, which is somehow uh, giving back to the world in the, the greatest way possible. And I think that, you know, you said build businesses with sustainability mm-hmm. and other things. Um, I've done that in some cases, and then in other cases I haven't. The Beanie Baby business is a perfect example of something that, uh, you know, I did it for a year and I got out. I basically just sold a product for a year when it was really hot and really uh, hyped up, and uh, I had the product, so you know, kind of supply and demand, the, the demand was definitely there. And then when I started the printing business, I never had aspirations of becoming the next Hallmark. It was just something I could do with very little startup capital. So that's why I did the printing business. And then, yeah, and God, God forbid, you were nine years old. You should have had more insight into this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, what was I thinking? But, I mean, when you look at it, too, and you say 12 businesses over basically a 12-year period, um, sure, I sold a number of those businesses, and they continued on. But oftentimes, I just used each one as a stepping stone just to get to the next level. You know, I couldn't have started out with certificate swap 12 years ago um, because basically gift certificates weren't around, gift cards weren't around, and also the Internet wasn't as popular as it is today, and there's no way I could have done it. So I think that I've kind of leveraged each business and used it as a stepping stone to really reach my much larger goals, and, uh, and that is to you know, help the world. Right, right. Now, what are some absolute essential areas of development for a small business owner to be successful? I mean, there's a lot of books. There's a lot of inputs in the world, and everyone seems to have an opinion that they're willing to share, even if you ask for it or not, about how to be successful in business. Um, you know, what are some of the essential things that you would say to people that are listening there saying, okay, you know, yeah, you have an inspirational story, um, you've done a lot of cool things, um, you know, if, if you had the list, just what are the, the areas where I absolutely need to uh, focus on to be effective, because I know in your book, and you do talk about this when asked, is is about the difference between being busy and being effective. And what what I wanted you to, if you could, distill some of the uh, things, traits, characteristics, uh, activities that are absolutely essential to uh, being a success as an entrepreneur. Well, I think uh, one thing right off the bat is to surround yourself with great people. 
I think that there's so much we can learn from, from having great people around us. That's one key. But another thing is, is that when we can partner with people or bring, you know, employees onto our team and, uh, and basically they can bring skills that complement ours. For instance, people would be shocked to know that I know very little about computers and I know very little. I can't do a website. I can't make images. I can't do anything that has to do with really any of my businesses. But I come up with the idea and then I surround myself with great people that have those talents. So, you know, if I wanted to create a new software program and I had a great idea for it, then I would go out and I would find the programmers who could build, uh, you know, the best software program in the world, and that's what we would do. So I think surround yourself with great people is really important. Um, balance work with life is really important. Uh, I had to do that, and I had to learn that at a really early age because I went to school for seven hours during the day. Then I came home, and I had Boy Scouts or soccer practice, you know, or dates with girls or whatever the case. And then uh, late at night is when I ran my businesses. So I had to kind of learn time management the hard way. And uh, I think you, you, Joe, and I are both in a program strategic coach that helps entrepreneurs um, balance their work with life because, you, you know, you won't be successful in either if you can't do that. And uh, another one is, I think, just as a business lesson that I talk about pretty frequently is adapt or die. I think that companies need to always be adapting to their customer needs and also their competition, or the business will die. So you have to always be changing because uh, even if you're in a market that doesn't have competition now, you will, whether it's in three months, six months, or a year from now, you need to always be ready. You need to always be improving your products and services so that your customers uh, uh, hopefully will always come back to you. Okay, let's go deep on adapt or die. Um, when do you call it quits? When do you – what are some warning signs or at least some clear indications that, you know, uh, I want to make this thing work, but it's just not working in the amount of effort, the amount of grief, the amount of capabilities that I'm lacking or whatever? Because, you know, people start businesses every day. Many of them, most of them, fail because uh, they go into them without the right capabilities, without the right investment, without the right selling and marketing skills. Um, when is it time to cut your losses and get out? Well, I'll add something to that, too. A lot of people start businesses for the wrong reasons. So regardless of product, you know, the market or their own capabilities, a lot of people just start a business because they want to be rich. They want to have a nicer house, a nicer life for themselves, and that's commendable. But if you're not starting the business really to, to help others, you're not going to be rewarded, and you're really looking at it short-sighted. Um, so, so I think that you have to be willing to start the business for the right reasons. But how do you know when to sell it, when to close it? Um, you know, I don't think there's necessarily – I know there's not a method to my madness. Um, I simply basically get bored with an idea and or come up with a new idea that I think is much greater, and I can take part of the capital from that business and invest it into something that's larger. That's kind of what I did. And uh, each business was kind of the stepping stones or the foundation for the next business that was a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, and, you know, they grew over time. But I think when you're not passionate about something, you're not going to be successful with it, and maybe that's the time you should look to sell the company, um, to close the company if you can't sell it, um, or to maybe, have, you know, have partners buy you out, or to have someone come in and run it so that maybe you can remove yourself from the business. You still own it, but you can remove yourself and you can focus on what you're passionate about and then you can maybe have two successful businesses. You know, let's talk about that old subject to do what you love and the money will follow sort of thing. I, I had a mentor who was kind of a pretty cynical, negative guy, very smart, uh, but he used to say things like, uh, yeah, you know, that whole make, uh, do what you love and the money will follow is a bunch of crock. If I could, you know, eat pizza and watch football and sit on a hammock all day and make money, I would, uh, that's what I love doing. So, you know, I just haven't figured out how to make money doing that, so I have to do other things for money. And you know, so I would, of course, that when you're when you're listening to someone that you heavily respect in one area, you can tend to you know take it too far and believe that they're they're legitimately right, and there is no such way to love what you do and the money will follow. And then I get introduced to people like Dan Sullivan, who really talks about you know unique ability and something that gives you never ending you know excitement and energy, and you like doing it, and the more you do it, you get better at it. And for instance, stay these interviews. You know, I'm interviewing you right now. I do a lot of interviews. It's something that I do that people actually pay money to listen to my interviews and to 
eavesdrop in on interesting conversations. And what I really like about this sort of thing for me is I have conversations like this all the time. Some of them I record, others I don't. And I consider this a conversation with a very smart person that I'd want to be talking to and asking them questions anyway because that's how I learn things. It's interesting to me. I love it. I do it even if I didn't get paid for it, yet I still get paid for it. And that's an example of doing something you love in you know, building a business around it. So what are the the ways that you would encourage people that are in a job they hate? They're in a business that just causes them grief and they're reading, you know, books about the law of attraction and being positive and this and that and it just ain't clicking for them. What, what, what do they need to do in order to make it click? If you chase the money, the money will run out. But if you chase the skills and the knowledge, the money will come to you. So if you surround yourself with great people, it's if you, you know, get all the education, and that doesn't necessarily have to be in the classroom. I always, um, even though I did not graduate college, we haven't talked about that on this call, but I did not graduate college. I left after a semester. Um, I was offered a scholarship to return, but I didn't. Well, and, what do you, uh, wait, on that, what do you say to the colleges that are Ivy League schools that ask you to speak for them to their graduating class? How do you, how do you skip through that way? <laughs> well, it's funny because, you know, I, I gave a speech a few years back at the, at Wharton at the University of Pennsylvania, and that is a perfect example of a school that I would never in a million years, even with all of my connections today and everything else, um, I would never get accepted to the school. And that's literally how I started off my speech. I said, I hope all of you um, you know, have enjoyed your four years here because uh, I would have never had the opportunity to sit in any of those chairs. And uh, <laughs> yet here I am. Somehow I'm supposed to be here to talk to you about my story, so it's quite flattering. Um, and two, the college where I went to school, Virginia Tech, my book, You Call the Shots, is now required reading for management students at the school, and I speak there every semester. Um, so that's kind of exciting, and that's an honor to me. And, and I, I left school for the right reasons. I left school because I had a lot of opportunities. You know, I, did, I didn't drop out um, for the wrong reasons. I had a lot of opportunities, and I felt like that these opportunities that we're facing might not be available if I passed them up right now and if I waited, you know, three or four years until I graduated. And I wanted to take advantage of that, and I said, hey, I can get an, an education later. And eventually I probably will go straight into a, an MBA program and, and get, you know, my master's in business. So I think that education is really important, but there's so much I could say, but I really don't know the best way to put it. Well, you know, it's, it's, it, I think you just made it, it a really good distinction, it, which is a hard decision. You were faced with, you know, I could stay in school and do what probably a lot of people would be pressuring you and saying is the right thing to do, or you had other opportunities and you needed to make a decision. And those are decisions where a lot of times, you know, you're alone in those decisions because you sure. may have the rest of the world's not getting it or, you know, saying, well, he, he, there's an intuition that you kind of feel. And I think all human beings, if they pay attention to it, you know, life has a very interesting way of giving us cues. And part of it is do we ignore them? Do we face it? Do we let the fear, you know, uh, cripple us from, from moving forward? And, you know, when you were put in that situation of, man, you know, there's some other opportunities here, you just made uh, probably a, a judgment call, and, you, and it was, I'm sure, very risky. However, there was a voice somewhere inside your head that said, you know, go for it, because this yeah, may not exactly. be around, and you've leveraged that. And I think that has that speaks volumes about if if people want to see the method to your madness. You, you said an interesting thing. There really isn't a method to my. Uh, you know, I think there's a method to everyone's uh, way, and I and I think most people are not even aware of it. And I think sometimes that's what's so great about asking people questions is it reveals things about what they do and how they do it and why. And 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 I think that's where real learning comes from. And I, and I think that too. All of my decisions. Um, I left, I attended a boarding school for freshman year and part of my sophomore year in high school. And I said to my dad, it was an all-guys boarding school, I said, Dad, I want to come home. You know, uh, all my friends are getting cars, girlfriends are serious. I'm at this all-boys school where cars aren't allowed, and also I couldn't even have Internet in my room. So you can imagine how that was uh, difficult managing Internet businesses. Um, and I said, I want to come home. And he said, the only way you can come home is if you reimburse me the $25,000 tuition. You know, I know you've made some good business decisions in the past. I hope you'll think long and hard about this one. And I said, Dad, I'll pay you back the 25000 if you come get me. And I wrote him a check, and I was 15 years old. And I came home, and I graduated from the high school where, you know, I would have attended here with all of my friends that I grew up with. And a message that I always 
share with people is make your own tough decisions. I've never been one to just try and take the easy road. Um, you know, I could have just stayed in college and taken the easy path, but instead I left college and I wrote a book and I've literally traveled the world in the past couple of years um, trying to spread the message of entrepreneurship. But, but more than that, just spread the message to young people and to small business owners, hey, go for whatever it is you want in life. It doesn't have to be starting a business. It's whatever it is you want. And, uh, and I've, you know, sure, the money will follow, hopefully. But, but that's kind of my thing. And, and then it's something else I always say. People ask me, you know, do you ever regret any of those decisions? And I say, no, I never had a regret about one decision I've ever made because you can't do anything to change it. So, you know, how would my life be totally different if I had graduated that boarding school and then I got it into a, maybe an Ivy League school or a, a top college university? I don't know. Maybe. Would it have been better? I don't know. Maybe. Might have been a lot better. Doesn't matter. I can't change it. So why worry about it? Yeah, yeah. Why, why business? Why do you like business so much? What's it, why is it exciting to you? Well, look at all of the people in this world that work in business, you know, whether that's working for someone else, whether that's working for an office. When, when you really narrow it down, if, there's, if, if you don't have a unique talent that's, you know, around singing or playing sports, um, you know, or the Olympics or really, you know, anything else, you're going to somehow be involved in business. Now, of course, um, we, we could talk about uh, the difference between different types of corporations, and we could talk about nonprofits. And I'm very big into helping uh, charities and nonprofits, and I've been on the board of uh, an at-risk high school program that helps at-risk high school kids either stay in school and graduate and get real-life job skills so that they can go out into the workforce and get a job, or they can go on to college and they can get their grades up. So I'm really passionate about that and organizations, but even if you work for a charity or a nonprofit, that's still a business. You know, if they didn't have any donations coming in, the charity wouldn't last very long. And the marketing techniques that apply to a for-profit business also apply to a nonprofit charity. So I think that that's really important that when I say, you know, we're almost all in business, I'm including, you know, charities and nonprofits and everything in that. And basically I kind of just realized when I was really young that, hey, I'm probably going to be in business. Um, I look at my dad. He had a Ford dealership and still does, and he has uh, 150 employees, and all those people there are in business. You know, even if they're maybe a mechanic or a service writer or a salesperson, they're all around business. So I said I need to develop my own traits and develop those skills, and once I develop them, no one can take them away from me, and that's my unique ability and my unique advantage. You've met some incredible um, business mentors. Uh, you've always been a student. Uh, you're always wanting to learn things. Uh, I, I love that. I think it's one of the biggest attributes of successful people is they realize that, you know, there's always someone out there that has a new take on something. There's always ways to innovate. There's there's always uh, areas of improvement, and just the the natural curiosity that comes with the desire to read and learn, and just developed uh, skills is is half the battle of of having skills is just the wanting the desire to to go out and get it so uh, what are some suggestions that you would give people on simply learning uh, to be a better entrepreneur because i i mean i i fortunately am in a position to where uh you know i can read your books and stuff and 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 talk to you about business and areas here but also we've spent a lot of time you know we've got a vacation uh together we've uh, you know hung out a lot we've had a lot of private dinners and lunches and, and I see what goes on backstage, and you're truly, uh, you know, you have this definite desire and inquisitive curiosity to always go out and, and learn new things, and so you, you work hard at it, and you do it, and you're good at it, and you meet incredible people. So what are, what are some of the suggestions you would have for people? I would almost consider myself a knowledge junkie. Um, even, like, businesses that I would never consider starting myself, um, I'm always asking questions to those people that own them. And, you know, when people come up to me, even whether they're in high school or whether they're 40 or 50 years old, and they say, hey, I want to start a restaurant, and I'd say, okay, well, have you ever worked in a restaurant? They'd say no. And I'd say, well, that would be the first piece of advice I can give you to starting a restaurant would be to go and work in one, learn every single thing you possibly can. And then you may, first of all, realize that, you know, no, you don't want to start a restaurant, and that's probably the worst business you could start as far as, you know, success or failure rate. Um, but I think I'm a knowledge junkie, and I think even though, you know, I haven't graduated college, I said, my dad did tell me this when I was a kid. He said, or actually when I was in high school, he said, you know, you can grow up and you can lose all your money, you can lose your wife, you can lose your car, you can lose your house, but you can never lose the knowledge that you learn or the experiences, you know, that, that one has. And that kind of set in with me, and that made the decision to leave college that much harder um, but then I kind of said, you know, I can get my education in the real world. 
um, a lot of my experience is already Trump, uh, you know, anything I could learn here in the classroom. And I think that that's kind of, you, you know, we're only as good as our own kind of, if you look at your brain as a muscle, you know, if you want to get stronger, you, you go and you work out. Uh, if you're Michael Jordan or Tiger Woods, uh, you have a coach. Successful business leaders also have coaches, and they also surround themselves um, with people that maybe complement their skills or they can also they can learn from. And any time I meet someone, um, you know, millionaire, billionaire, um, someone that's just starting, I try and learn everything I can from that person. And they may they may look at it as that they're learning something from me. And you know, wow, that's <laughs> I appreciate it. But but no, that's not the case. I'm trying to learn everything I can about their business and about them. And that's really what excites me. Yeah, well, you've now been put out there as a coach and a mentor and an advisor, and you get you get more requests to have you know people ask you to speak to them to address you know large audiences and tell them what you do and how you do it, and more more people want this than you physically have the time to do it. So you have to obviously be selective in, in who you train and teach, and so that has actually put you in the position of of publishing books and and, and creating information. Uh, knowledge products and things like that. Uh, if you had some suggestions uh, for people listening on how you have best learned things that have been beneficial to you, what would you encourage them to do? Is it, I mean, are you, how, how many books do you read a year? Do you have any sort of uh, idea of, have you ever looked at the, the way that you educate yourself? Uh, I think that's, I think that's interesting. I've, I've learned a lot of my skills growing up. I learned by doing. You know, I learned about, uh, um, you know, the C Corp versus an S Corp, um, not from a classroom, but from an attorney because I needed to set up a, my first corporation when I was just a little kid. So I learned a lot of these things by doing, and I learned a lot of them the hard way, marketing and advertising especially. Um, you know, as starting out, it cost me thousands of dollars um, because I didn't really know what I was doing, and that's why I said, hey, there's got to be a better way, and that is to maybe maybe read a book from someone that knows what they're talking about because I certainly don't know as you know, a 12- or a 13-year-old, and I tried to pick up all those skills along the way. How many books do I read uh, a year now? Um, you know, I try to read as many as I can, but um, I'd be lying if I told you I read more than one or two a month. And um, I think that I, I try and still stay sharp on my game, and I know there are plenty of people that read many more books, you know, many people that read a, a book or two a week, and I wish I could do that. Um, it's just it's just I don't have the ability. And uh, uh, to sit down and do that, and normally I read when I fly. Um, so I, I knock books out when I'm on planes, or I'm knocking work out when I'm on planes. So I, I'm kind of a, a knowledge junkie, like I've said a couple times. But um, you know, so much today, it's more from the real world and more from the relationships that I've created and from the people I've met. Trying to learn everything I can that way, and to also learn, you know, through seminars. And when I've spoke, I've spoken at your seminar, you know, the past three years, which has been an honor, and I thank you. Um, but I also have learned from all the other speakers that are there. You know, I'm just there to share my story and to share what I know. There's, you know, half a dozen other speakers that are going to share their story and what they know. So I learn from that, too. And I think that that's kind of really powerful because you're actually there. And, of course, too, I get to meet the people, which is great. <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. And, you know, I have some speakers that I know that they will never, you know, they think that their speech is, like the end all and be all most amazing thing on the planet and they they're in and they're out you know they talk to people and they scoot out of there and there's other people that just sit and simply uh listen and and it was kind of funny i was, I was a speaker at one of my buddies uh Evan, he's your friend too evan pagan who runs a very successful company and he uh you know started this thing called altitude and um you know, I, I spoke at one of his conferences, and I literally, uh, all these other speakers, uh, not every single one of them, but the majority of them, uh, were out in the hallway the whole time, you know, chatting, goofing off and everything, and I'm sitting in there the entire time, and someone came up to me and said, you know, the reason I like you the most out of all of these speakers is not only do you say stuff, but when I've ever been at events where you speak, and I hardly ever speak, you know, I don't do that many events other than my own, they're like, you're always in the audience taking notes. And, you know, to me, you know, I, I kind of took that. So I thought about that. I was like, huh, that's kind of interesting. And I started paying attention to how other speakers actually respond. And that's not to say that everyone should 
sit through every single session, in, you know, unless it's applicable to you. What I have found, though, is, and I'm involved in a world of a lot of, of authors and speakers and people that are in the how-to business, and there are a lot of people that just they, they get to a stage to where they think they know it all. And they don't because they're not students anymore, and they they kind of shut off the the need to learn, and they just get into the talking mode. And it kind of has a lot to do with what you said earlier. You know, you got two ears and a in a mouth for a reason, and some people literally plug up their ears to education. And I think it's one of the most detrimental things uh, for moving forward. Whenever I'm in a bad position. You know, there's a book somewhere. There's a person I could talk to. There's some message that my brain uh, could benefit from by hearing it if, uh, as long as I have the desire to listen and as long as you're open-minded. And, and that's what's critical. And, and so the thing that I, that I really want to convey, and, and, you know, obviously the reason I'm asking you about this is, is it's great to have you convey it from your perspective, is that if you're out there right now and there's any area of your life or your business that you need handled, there's a way to get it handled, and it may not completely solve the problem. You know, what you may identify through asking, through reading, is that, you know, uh, this is kind of like the serenity prayer. You know, grant me, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change or the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. And there's, there's a lot of uh, things that can be changed um, if you simply pursue it. You know, like your first chapter, just go for it, go and do it. And there's other things that... They simply can't. And uh, so anyway, what? I, think, I think you're right on. Probably that's that right. That nugget right there is people first have to just realize, and and a lot of people too won't admit that they you know even have a problem or that they even you know need to change. Um, and maybe you know, of course, we see it on the speaking circuit. People think that they kind of know it all. For me, I'm when I'm out there on the speaking circuit, I'm just a 23 year old kid. Um, I look up to all these other people and. Uh, you know, they might think my story is interesting, but I think their story is interesting. And I always look up to these people, and that's why, too, I think I'm uh, – you're the most brilliant networker I've ever met. But I think I'm a really good networker because I, um, I don't just meet people, but I actually carry on the conversation afterwards. And there's actually, you know, a, a method to that madness because, you know, maybe down the road I'll be able to help that person out. Maybe down the road they'll be able to help me out. And I think that that's kind of a two-way street, and it opens a dialogue and that's why I'm always meeting uh, new people. And I try to surround myself with great people and with people smarter than me. And uh, I think that's the key to success. Yeah, you know, David Ogilvy, who's one of the greatest uh, advertising minds that ever lived, wrote a fabulous book called Ogilvy on Advertising and just a very smart guy. And you know those little Russian dolls where you open them up and there's a smaller one and you open that one up and there's a smaller one and there's a smaller one? Well, um my friend Lisa Wagner gave me uh, one of those from Russia, and um, at the last uh, coaching group that I did, I, I made an example of something that David Ogilvy would would do. It he, he would pull it out with uh, with uh, you know people that he would hire, and he would explain that you know if you can either be a company of dwarfs or a company of giants, if you surround yourself with people smaller than you, you're actually going to have a smaller company. If you surround yourself with people larger than you, you're going to have a larger company. And I think that doesn't apply just to business. I think in any, any area of life where you always seek out people, uh, you know, that, that just literally have skills that you don't, and there, there's so much to be learned. And then the point is this, uh, you know, if there is a secret uh, to your success, one of the secrets is, is you're always willing to put yourself out there, and you're always willing to go and find people that are smart and leverage that skill, and you're willing to learn from them. I I mean, for instance, you're the youngest uh, person ever uh, to enroll in Strategic Coach, which is one of the highest level coaching programs for successful entrepreneurs through Dan Sullivan. You know, I mean, you're already successful. It's not like you needed to do this in order to, you know, be successful. You did it because you knew it would give you an edge, and that's the message I want to get out to people. Like, everyone that's even taken the time to listen to this conversation, the mere fact that they even have the desire to listen to this and and eavesdrop in on a conversation and hear how you've done it, that is half the battle of, of being successful because you're out there doing that. So, I, you know, it's just the Joe Polish attempt of constantly encouraging people to keep educating themselves, it, increase the intensity. You know, if that means read more books, attend more seminars, digest more programs, go for it. You know, one of the things people say, well, I can't buy this book because I already have four books I haven't read or I've got, you know, piles of books. Not, you know, my whole thing is like, well, really? So do I. So what? You know, I, 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 it, it, it constantly keeps your mind stimulated and just 
that's what works. And, and, and there's one cliche that may sound corny uh, that I don't know where I first heard it, but uh, it, it goes something like this, that uh, not all readers are great leaders, but I don't know any great leaders that are not readers. And it may not be a book. I mean, you may not necessarily read a book. You take our friend Dean Graziosi, who, you know, is a phenomenal entrepreneur. At the time of me having this conversation with you, he's bringing in over a million dollars a week in revenue with uh, five employees. And he's read less than six books uh, in his entire life, because I recently talked him into reading a book. Uh, it, it used to be five. But, you know, he still is a great educator. He, he does it through having conversations with people and finding mentors and things like that. So uh, now, having said that, what I want to do is have you kind of give some real specific uh, steps on things that people can do to learn more from you. Um, if they haven't read your book, read your book. What other things are you up to? I mean, uh, and I can also put in a blatant plug for a program that me, you, and, and, and Dean, who I just mentioned, actually recorded. But what are some of the ways that people can learn some stuff from you and kind of follow your your success track? And because you have, you, you know, it's just getting bigger and bigger the amount of uh, amount of uh, fans that you have and, and people that are learning from you. Well, well, thank you. So my book is called "You Call the Shots," and, and two, we've. Uh, I think that that's really important. Don't let anyone else control your life, and you should really make decisions for yourself, and that's why I came up with the, the title, Hey, You Call the Shots, because that's what, if you look back on my life, I didn't realize it while I was doing it, but that's exactly what I was doing as I was kind of just uh, plowing through all the obstacles and uh, kind of creating my own life and kind of calling the shots in my life, and I started really young. Uh, my website's CameronJohnson.com, and uh, like you, you just mentioned, Joe, we just finished creating a, a program, a six-CD audio program, um, called Millionaire Secrets, but what we also did was we created a website called MillionaireSecrets.com, and we've put up a free quiz where an entrepreneur or a wannabe entrepreneur can come on there and they can take uh, answer a few questions, and it, it simply diagnoses what it is they need and what they can use to better their business um, and to really better their life. And that's at MillionaireSecrets.com, and we created that uh, you, myself, and Dean Graziosi, and I guess we felt that. You know, the three of us see so many people out there trying to teach material, but they're just teaching, you know, repurposed material that they've never actually experienced. So we felt like the three of us had uh, basically different enough backgrounds that we could come together and share all of our different kind of, kind of been there, done that stories, uh, stories of success, story of failure, uh, stories where, you know, Dean spent millions of dollars on things that didn't work. And, uh, and obviously those are lessons that can save other people a lot of money. And uh, I think it's – I'm really proud of it, and that's why we kind of put up the free quiz, and maybe there's something else you want to add. Yeah, I would just say that uh, it's, you know, uh, it's it's one of the most uh, unique and interesting things that I think has been done uh, in terms of the area of, of marketing and promotions and advertising, getting three different perspectives from people that have – you know, very much the same sort of value systems and how they sell and, and, and what they market, just completely different uh, products and services and methodologies of how to do it, but all of it is integrated, and we've set it up as a cookbook. So, uh, you know, the last thing that people need is to, to go through very long books that are complicated and complex when they just simply need a solution to something. So just like a cookbook, if you just simply need a recipe, you go to a certain page, you look for what it is you're looking for, or boom, there you have it. And so that's what the program has been uh, laid out to do for any particular business uh, issue that we have experience with. Um, we have laid it out there, and, and the reason we did it together is we wanted three different perspectives because there are more than one way to be right. And so you can hear, you know, Dean Graziosi, who has an extensive background in, in real estate and started selling cars and now is one of the top infomercial people in the world um, and New York Times best-selling author with two books, although he's read less than six books his whole life. Uh, it's, it's just a, a great perspective from people that have really been there, done that, and me, my experience with service businesses, starting off as a dead broke carpet cleaner and learning the skills that I have in order to you know build a multi-million dollar business and, and more importantly help you know, tens of thousands of uh, entrepreneurs all over the world um, with with more effective marketing strategies, what I call ELF, easy, lucrative, and fun. And then, of course, you, Cameron, with your nine different businesses before you got out of high school and, and all the things you know, we've all put it together so people can get a different uh, perspective and take in a very short, condensed, 
useful tactical way so you can take that knowledge and go and use it and, and have success uh, in your business uh, right away. And so, the, yeah, you have a really cool test on MillionaireSecrets.com. I would encourage everybody to do that just to see the process. It's it's really a neat uh, way to kind of evaluate where you're at and, and all that jazz. Now, um, in terms of if you could only um, speak to someone for, say, five minutes and encourage them with all of your life experience condensed into, look, I've only got five minutes to speak with you. Here's You want to be a successful business owner. Uh, here's what I would recommend would be some of the steps that you can take to, to give you the highest possibility of success. Here's what I'd recommend. What would you say to those people? And it doesn't necessarily need to be five minutes. I'm just creating that context uh, uh, to further. An elevator pitch, an elevator pitch for success. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I think that. Um, you know, if I was just meeting someone and, uh, you know, they, they knew who I was and they said, hey, uh, you know, I want to start my own business, what can you tell me? And I think uh, the first thing I would do is say, you need to read you call the shots. <laughs> but that's, of course, going to take more than five minutes. But I think it's important um, for people. I would tell them literally the first chapter and the first step, um, and it sounds repetitive, but I can't say it enough, is to put yourself out there and to go and actually do whatever it is you want to do. Um, and likewise, if you're thinking about starting a business and you know nothing about it, I mean, that's great. But there's ways to learn and to get that real-life education without having to pay for it. You can go if you want to start a restaurant and work for a restaurant. Um, whatever business it is you want to create, you should have, you, and you should know that business inside out. And I always said, I've got a television inter- interview when I was 10 years old, and I say at the end of the, uh, the end of this segment, you know, keep lower prices than your competitors if you can. And that's kind of uh, you know a, a cute catchphrase. But also, if you can beat your competitors on price and also on service. Um, then, of course, you're going to be successful. But um, I think it's, it's even more than that, and that is uh, I believe in knowing your competition inside out, knowing more about your competitors than they know about themselves, uh, knowing you know, the lifetime value of your customer. So let's, let's actually look at, um, if you have a business now, let's actually take a look at, and you can take out pen and paper and you can actually do this, you can ask your team to do this. What does it cost us every time we turn away a sale? Um, you know, maybe uh, a customer, if, if we've got a, you know, bug extermination business and they would be coming every month, you know, that's $30. Our, our average customer comes for, uh, you know, two years. So if that's $30 a month, that's $360 a year, that's $720. So that's $720, of course, in, minus out the expenses for the guy to actually come and, you know, spray your house. But that's $720 in revenue that we're going to lose by simply somehow missing a sale or somehow not closing a lead. And when you look at it that way, you can really find money. Uh, you can find money in your couch and find money in your business that's not being uh, basically optimized or taken advantage of, and you instantly can grow your business. A lot of people think to grow their business, they just need to instantly spend more money market marketing or spend more money advertising uh, or or get a new bigger location um, or or to hire more people. And that's not necessarily answer. Yeah, let's look at how you can improve your business without spending any money, because that's the way I had to grow up and do all of my businesses. They all had to be lean and mean, and I had very little capital to work with. And another chapter, chapter two in my book is start small. And I cite, of course, Dell, Microsoft started small, I started small. Um, many successful businesses started small, and that actually helps them, because I think that I, ne- I never take, uh, took on venture capital, and I turned down venture capital a number of times. And when I was a kid, had I taken on venture capital for one of my Internet companies, like obviously many of companies did, uh, I would have failed because I would have basically had an open checkbook and I wouldn't have known what I was doing and I would have spent all the money and I would have, you know, uh, I wouldn't have done obviously the, the stupid lavish offices with the gymnasiums and things like that. But And I probably wouldn't have done a Super Bowl ad either. Um, but when you have access to the resources, you basically just take advantage of them and and you actually should not. So that's why I encourage people to start with as little investment as possible. It's also easier to show uh, to be profitable then because you have less invested. And when you have less invested and you become profitable sooner, you actually enjoy the business more. <laughs> you know, the longer it takes you for your business to become profitable, the more you hate it and the more uh, more likely you are to give up, the biz- the more likely the business is to actually fail because uh you know, it, it can't make it forever without making money. And I think you have to start small to be successful, but overall you have to just take the first step. Yeah, and you just made a, a great point about investment. I mean, that's why you look at lottery winners that the majority of them lose the money and many of them actually go bankrupt and go into heavy debt after winning large sums of money because when you give money to somebody without the skills of knowing what to do with it, 
uh, you can create a very dangerous and wasteful situation. Whereas if you really invest in the greatest asset you have, first and foremost, which is that brain of yours sitting on your head, like you mentioned, your father said they can never take away that knowledge, and you fill that up, uh, you fill up your you know, bank account in your brain with knowledge and skills, then that absolutely is is the way that I would encourage people because I had to figure out how to make money when I didn't have any. And if I needed, you know, the whole saying, it, it takes money to make money, well, you know, not not necessarily. Um, I, you know, I didn't have any money when I got started. And the more I relied on, on my knowledge and I kept adding to that, the better. So, you know, my lesson and takeaway from what you just said is uh, a more reinforcement of, of why I always want to introduce you to my listeners as much as I can. Uh, just be a student. Go out there and be a student and learn and apply, and you can make it happen. So uh, read Cameron's book, uh, CameronJohnson.com. Go to take the test on MillionaireSecrets.com. If anyone wants the program that me, Cameron, and uh, Dean uh, did together, it's, it's pretty freaking awesome. Uh, you can get details about it at MillionaireSecrets.com. Watch Cameron. Uh, you will see an individual that I believe uh, will become one of the most influential entrepreneurs uh, in the country, possibly in the world. And he's not only going to continue uh, to have great success, but he's going to do a lot of good things in the world. And you'll see that because you do do a lot of good things. You fund a lot of charities. You 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 are very. Uh, very good with social entrepreneurism, and uh, it is always a pleasure and a joy to interview you and talk about all of this stuff. Any famous last words? Um, <laughs> I would just say uh, my website, CameronJohnson.com, like you mentioned, and at the end of the day, be the entrepreneur you want to be and do it for the right reasons. Absolutely. Great. Cameron, thank you so much. It's, it's always a pleasure. And uh, and I will just tell my listeners, I will always keep you in the loop as best as I can about what Cameron is doing. But you know what? Uh, he's probably going to be a heck of a lot more famous than I will. So just pay attention to him and watch what he does and uh, go from there. Thank you, Cameron. Thanks, Joe. The pleasure is mine. Hello, this is Joe Polish. I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to this interview. I hope you found it very useful. Please give me your feedback on all of the interviews that you listen to. I'd love to hear your feedback so we can always deliver a great program for you. Our website is www.joepolish.com, and we also have a Joe Polish Recommends section, so you can take a lot of the ideas and concepts that you hear on my Genius Network interview series and apply them to your business and find vendors and resources. You can go to joepolish.com to find that information and click on the Joe Polish Recommends section. And also, if you would like to find out about more interviews and invest in more useful Genius Network series interviews, go to www.joepolish.com dot geniusnetwork.com. Thanks and eat your competition alive.